Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Philip Phillips, and I'm the Associate Dean of the University Honors College, and I'm pleased to welcome everyone here today to our Spring Honors Lecture Series on American Values. Uh, I'd like to invite Dr. Mary Evans, who is the co-facilitator of this series, to come and introduce our speaker. I can't tell everyone how exceedingly pleased and happy I am um, for to have this speaker today who um, really we've had a very uh, spectacular line of speakers all spring um, but this young woman is one of the most revered and uh, wise and articulate and um, wonderful human beings in all of our state of Tennessee, and I'm very proud of her. She was a former student of mine back some number of years ago. She's um, a happily married lady right now with three children, and she is an activist, a social activist in the state of Tennessee um, beyond compare. Um, Kassar Abdullah came to the United States quite a number of years ago when she was a small, small child. She's Kurdish by ethnicity, uh, was a native of Kurdistan, the section in northern Iraq. And when former Iraqi President Saddam Hussein and his henchman Chemical Ali, how we know the gentleman, waged war on the Kurds in 1988, Ms. Abdullah, at the age of six, lost several family members and was forced to become a refugee. Uh, initially, she and her family escaped to a refugee camp across northern Iraq, across the Taurus Mountains and went into northeastern Turkey. And after four years there, her family was given refugee status, brought to the United States, and they settled initially in Fargo, North Dakota. She was about middle school age at that point in time. And through hard work and perseverance, she made it through school and made it to college. Um, and from then, she has gone on to complete graduate work. In fact, um, Dean Steve Joyner, who was here only last month from Lipscomb, who heads the Masters in Conflict Management. She received her Masters in Conflict Management from Lipscomb University. And our own um, honors graduate, Tracy Madison, is in that program right now. Um, she has been educated at the University of Southern California's Fellowship on American Muslim Civic Leadership. She has been through Leadership Nashville, Leadership Tennessee. She's an alumna of all of those. And early on, she became clearly an advocate for the rights of human beings in this country because as an immigrant to this country, she experienced firsthand what people who are not Christians often experience and how they are treated differently than other Americans. Um, she dedicates now her professional life to this work. She's a social justice educator, um, a mediator, an advocate, and an organizer. She's held many amazing positions, both with the um, Tennessee Immigrant and Refugee Rights Coalition. Um, currently, she's the Chief Equity, Div um, Diversity, and Inclusion Officer at the Valor Collegiate Academies. Um, she has helped found so, many found so many organizations here in Tennessee, and she's on so many boards. She's a lady in very high demand, so we're very lucky to get her here at MTSU this afternoon. She's been highlighted and appeared in magazines and newspaper coverage. Um, she has been part of the Next Door Neighbor programming through Nashville Public Television. Um, she's one of the most highly visible um, uh, Tennesseans in our, in our current state. And uh, she was recognized by the President of the United States um, as a champion of change in 2013 in Washington, D.C. Um, and literally by every civic organization that you can name, she has had recognition. Um, for years, and every month it seems there is yet another one. She's speaking to us today um, using as the basis of her talk the 1883 Emma Lazarus poem that's very long. We, it's called the New Colossus, but it ends with those words that we know that are on the Statue of Liberty. Um, Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, um, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Her talk today is on America's very first core value, immigration to this country. Kassar. Thank you, Dr. Mary Evans. It's so good to be back here. It's always an honor to visit MTSU. Every time I come back, I feel like you're expanding and growing, and then I am lost in the parking lot looking for you. 
Um, so it's really an honor for me to be here, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, I've been around, but I'm very young, um, very, very young, believe me, no gray hairs. Um, so um, I met Dr. Evans at MTSU and just really uh, learned so much from her. You know, at that time, at that moment, while in the class with her, I wasn't a big fan of her, to be quite honest with you. Shh, don't tell no one. <laughs> Uh, but as I, you know, really grow older and I was like, wow, Dr. Evans, the one thing that she did for me that I hold even today is that she actually pushed me to have a growth mindset about everything that I run into in life. And that I am forever grateful to you, Dr. Evans. Um, so today's topic is very dear to me. It's about one of the core um, American values. Um, and it's about immigration. It's about diversity. Um, that have really sort of shaped us and strengthened us. If you look at the media, there's been now attempts to actually try to delete that and say we haven't been a nation of immigrants. I would like to just share some information with you. Most of my research and information are from the Migration Policy Institute, uh, from the American Community Survey, um, the Gallup research, um, and none of them, so I urge you to also uh, follow through with it. It's hard to sort of capture a whole nation's history um, in 25 minutes. So what I'm going to go over just a little bit is to talk about how immigration is really the human experience. Immigration is not unique to the United States. It is a global phenomenon. Um, if we're going to then look at the United States, how then the immigrants were extremely tired, poor, um, and then we'll talk a little bit about, uh, you know, this is um, Women's History Month, and I want to talk about two famous women, um, you know, the Lady Liberty and, of course, uh, Emma um, and her famous poem. And then also talk a little bit about immigration now. What does it really look like? So if you look at it, um, the human experience, again, the immigration is not unique. Some scientists have traced the human lineage to some of the originals, um, and then talked about that really immigration has been that human experience all around. Um, so how did we, United States, become such a diverse um, nation? It really all started back in the day um, when the first Americans came to United States. Um, the bridge that really connected Asia and America. Um, so if you can see, that's you know, where the first immigrants came, um, and they were Asian of descent. Um, but you're going to find that there were waves of immigration that happened in the United States. There, were, there are a couple that I really want to highlight in this presentation. One was really the Starving Times, um, Jamestown, 1607. Many of these were actually called gentlemen. They weren't really workers. They um, lived off of their family uh, income and family finances and family inherited goods. Um, and then Within one year, when they migrated to the United States, um, half of them actually died off, some due to diseases, others just due to starvation. Um, what we know about them is these earlier immigrants um, came here because of the economic opportunity. Um, they were really, their motivation was really gold. There was that thrive of economic prosperity. And then by 1620, almost about 20 years later, we had the pilgrims in the Plymouth uh, colony. And I struggled with that word at the beginning. I remember in uh, middle school when I heard of that, I thought they were going to Mecca. I was like, pilgrims going to Mecca? <laughs> um, and then I found out, no, it was the other way around. They were coming to the west side, not to the east side. And so about, about 100 of them came through the Mayflower. And we know that they actually came for religious freedom. Um, they were the type who actually advocated for the separation of church, uh, and particularly from the Church of England. Unfortunately, they also struggled. Um, many of them did not survive. Both of them had somewhat um, good and negative uh, relationship with the Native Americans. Um, I gotta say, they weren't quite wise to include the Native Americans into the integration process, and so therefore the integration process of these both colonies wasn't as successful as they had hoped. And so the struggle was really real. I, as a new American, I was really excited that I actually didn't appear on American soil at that time in the 1600s. So I was fortunate to come later on. 
So then there's also the women that I wanted to highlight, again, not just because this is w uh, Women's Month, but also she became an icon of one of the core American values um, around diversity and then in particularly just immigration. So who exactly was this woman? Um, she, Emma, Emma Lazarus, uh, she highlighted in her poem the value of diversity. She herself was a Jew, um, and she, her family had came here. She traced back her lineage to the Jewish community. And her sonnet in 1883 became extremely famous. When she had originally wrote the poem, she wrote it as a fundraiser, and she wanted to help get the Statue of Liberty up. Um, however, after her death, many of her friends uh, really made her dream come true. You will not find the exact quote in the book that the Statue of Liberty is holding, uh, but you will find it on the bottom, and particularly some of the key words, line 10 and 11, were the most uh, famous lines. So Emma's lines, her quotes, and particularly the last two, became extremely famous after the recent presidential elections. Um, her lines were on Twitter, they were on the street, they were everywhere you looked. Um, one of the favorite one that I love um, was by James uh, Comey. He said, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be breathe free. The wretched refuses of your teeming shores. Send these, the homeless, the tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp besides the golden door. And I thought that was really powerful for that moment, um, in particularly as it, immigration became the hot topic in the media. Now, before 1965, with immigration and different type of immigration, whether you volunteered to come to United States or you were forced to come to United States, there were still struggles of inclusion. Um, one group would really um, scapegoat the other group's struggle just to make it. Um, the, the treatments of African Americans, you know, through the slavery, but then the Chinese Exclusion Act came about to really ban the Chinese. If you look at some of the immigration waves, I don't have time to talk about all the waves, but this really shows how it all started. In the earlier immigration period, aside from the Native Americans, um, who came from the Asian continent, we mostly had European immigrants. Um, so, for example, the British came here and settled, so they were very European. They had a couple of things in common. They were all white, right? But they were very diverse as well. They were of different faith, even though Christianity was the arching umbrella of it, but they really had different faith. Later on, you even had Catholics coming in. They spoke different languages. Some spoke French, some spoke German, and some spoke Italian. Um, however, immigration today that you see, they tend to be a bit more brown. Um, you have MENA population, Middle Eastern, North African, um, and then I'll explain about how all of a sudden now actually we are becoming more okay with a certain type of immigration in certain type of um, the world, but not others. So immigration now, what does it really look like? Um, there's really not a whole lot of immigration taking place in the United States, believe it or not, according to other places in the world. There's only 13% in 2016. Um, but when you pay attention to the media, they really make it seem like as if it's more like 80, if not 90%. But when you look at the facts, this is again from the Migration Policy Institute, and you can, uh, you can look it up and go in depth about what countries, what nations, what nationality, and for what purpose people are immigrating to the United States. But again, I want you to know that it's only 13%, um, so there's not much to fear. So where do they live? The, again, this is according to the Migration Policy Institute. If you look at the top racket, that really shows the growth um, in some of the top states. So if you look at 2000 to 2016, um, you have Texas, California, Florida, New York, and New Jersey. Now, if you look at the per percentage growth, meaning really they look at the population and compare to um, the sort of existing population and the newcomer population, comparing it, that's the percent, percent, of, percent uh, growth, um, the second tab. So what do we know about these new Americans? So based on the report, again, um, immigrants, we know that they are extremely young. Um, this data was pulled in 2017. They are very young. 44% of them are actually children, um, 17 and younger. 
they naturalize. 49% of immigrants go through the naturalization process. So if there is a path for naturalization, vast majority of immigrants do take that path. The demographics, you know, 42% is white, 27% is Asian, 9% is black, 15% is other, 2% is biracial. Now, a little side note to that with demographics, they're a little funky. <laughs> they're really difficult to capture. And so when I first came to the United States, we were settled in Fargo, North Dakota. Um, you know, there were much people who, many people who looked like me. And I remember I was in fifth grade. I went up to my teacher, and I was helping fill out all the registration documents because, of course, my parents didn't understand English, couldn't read and write even in Kurdish. They were illiterate. And so I came to the category that said race. And I went to my teacher. I said, what is race? And she said, race is your color. I looked at myself. I was like, I'm 10. I don't see a 10 option. Um, and she said, no, 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 honey, I think you're Asian. I was like, OK, what is Asian? So I began to mark myself as an Asian. It wasn't until I came to Nashville in 1996, I was told by my teachers that I'm not Asian, that I'm white. So I, like my Jewish brothers and sisters, have finally arrived in the white category. Um, they also speak English. 78% of them speak English in their homes. Um, and it get, it's actually, it increases even more when the population is young. So I have three daughters. Um, and if you look at it again, in, throughout our history, by the second and third generation, these children lose their mother tongue. I have three daughters, you know, a 10-year-old, a 7-year-old, and a 2-year-old. My 10-year-old can have basic conversational Kurdish. My middle child constantly says, Mama, I don't understand grandma's language. Can you translate? Can you tell me what she's saying? And this is her. This is where she's at. Like She's not even able to communicate with her grandmother, who's actually in Kurdistan. So English itself as a language is not in danger. It is the most predominant language being spoken in the United States. It has become somewhat of an official language. Um, and so many immigrants and refugees learn it because it's a survival language. Nobody wants to feel deaf. Nobody wants to feel mute. Nobody wants to feel paralyzed. And when you go to a nation, when you go anywhere in the world, how many of you guys have traveled outside of the world? All right. Doesn't it feel better when you go to a place that you can speak their language, that you can communicate with. So not speaking English does not feel good. It does not feel good. Most of them make an attempt to learn it. The problem is there aren't existing structures that can help new Americans learn the language. Many of the churches or faith-based organizations have volunteered to take it upon themselves to teach adults ESL. Um, and our kids are taught ELL, English as a learning language through public school. They are also entrepreneurs. Um, so more than 40% of Fortune 500 companies were founded by immigrants. These are just a few of them, like Google's founder, Yahoo, Microsoft. Um, if you look at their entrepreneur, they come here with an entrepreneur mindset. They begin to create jobs. They begin to really get their hands dirty and work really hard to make it through. And of course, one of the most famous, famous um, person, not sure if you recognize him, he's a Syrian um, immigrant. So Apple, we all love Apple. He has created a global impact. And the fact that it was created in the United States by a Syrian refugee, really political refugee, uh, speaks volume as well. This is a state-by-state -state look at how immigration to America has changed over time. In 1850, the vast majority of newcomers were from Ireland and Germany. In the 1860s, the labor shortages during the Civil War created strong demand for immigrant labor. 1870 saw Mexico become the top country of origin in much of the Southwest, while British immigrants preferred the Rocky Mountain territories. The 1880 census showed that the Chinese were coming in large numbers. Many took dangerous jobs in the mines or on railroad building crews. For the next century, immigrants from Canada crossing the southern border would be the largest group settling in many of the northernmost American states. In 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act blocked the arrival of large numbers of Asian immigrants for much of the next century. Unfortunately, the overall microdata for the 1890 census were destroyed in a 1921 fire at the Department of Commerce. So fast forward to 1900, the turn of the century, when the territorial boundaries of the continental United States are settled. 
For the first time, Norwegians, Swedes, and Italians were the largest groups coming to the states of South Dakota, Minnesota, and Louisiana, respectively. 1910 shows us how quickly things can change, with large numbers of Russians and Italians arriving. The only state where Ireland was the top country of origin was tiny Delaware. With the American population exceeding 100 million in the 1920 census, there were equal numbers of German, Italian, and Russian-born immigrants. Many had fled Europe to escape the horrors of World War I. By 1930, the Industrial Revolution was in full swing and the country was growing rapidly from within, so the percentage of foreign-born fell. And for the first time since 1850, Mexico was the dominant country of origin for new arrivals to California. By 1940, the quotas and other congressional measures passed in the previous decade to restrict immigration sharply cut the foreign-born population to below 9%. 1950 saw the effects of the repeal of the Chinese Exclusion Act, as Chinese immigrants were finally welcomed back. Interestingly, Greeks were the largest group arriving in South Carolina. When Alaska and Hawaii became states in 1959, the year before the 1960 census, Canadians simply crossed the border to immigrate to the last frontier, but Filipinos crossed an entire ocean to become the Aloha state's largest group. By 1970, the percentage of foreign-born reached an all-time low. Italy was the only nation that had sent more than a million people. In 1980, after Congress began granting more visas to people from the Western Hemisphere, the number of states where Mexico was the top country of origin doubled in a decade, becoming the dominant foreign-born population in the entire country. And in 1990, America began to look like the diverse country we live in today. Mexico was tops in 18 states, Dominicans were the largest group coming to New York, and South Korea and Southeast Asian nations were the leading countries of origin in seven states. In the year 2000 census, the number of Mexican-born immigrants surpassed 9 million. It's also notable that India was the top country of origin in three states. And the 2010 census reveals exactly why America is quickly becoming so diverse. Only five states, all of them bordering Canada, received the most immigrants from a majority white country. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this visualization of America's immigration history. So understanding immigration policy, it's pretty complex. If you look at it here in the United States, many policies, we tend to look at it and we tend to update it and change it so it is much more competent to our time, our people, our generation, with the exception of immigration. Immigration is one of the policies that's old, outdated, and it's broken. And so the current immigration policies are actually not up to date to our life standards right now. So trying to understand immigration, um, legal immigration, right? If you go through a legal path, really looks like this. I'll tell you the story of, you know, I was fortunate. So in 1988, I was about six years old. We did not think about leaving our home country. My parents were farmers, agriculture farmers, and it was the most exciting year for me. I was six years old, I was going to start kindergarten. All I could ever think about was a backpack, books, and starting school with my sister. That was it, that was on my mind. And of course, once in a while, playing with a family donkey. Um, and then I was told that I had to flee. We heard bombs, you know, everything, you name it, uh, smoke and mustard gas seed was spread. My mother was pregnant at that time and she had five other kids. And so we just had to flee to the mountains and she thought too that we're gonna hide in the mountains until it cools off, the air cleans out the chemicals and we're gonna return. Unfortunately, that was the day I never saw Kurdistan again. I had to flee. And so we climbed for days and for three days and uh, four nights, and we went into the border Turkey. So Turkey, so Kurdistan itself is divided up uh, by Britain. If you know the region, there's uh, Kurdistan of Iraq, Kurdistan of Turkey, Kurdistan of Iran, um, you know, Kurdistan of Syria. So all that region, there's like a middle chunk that's really been divided up. And I was from Kurdistan of Iraq, and so I fled to Kurdistan of Turkey, which Turkey has, controls, colonizes. Um, and in there, for four years, I lived in a refugee camp. That was my elementary school life, was in a refugee camp. We didn't know where we would go. Um, our family had two options after the fourth year. Our name was picked through the refugee resettlement program and United Nations attempt to settle millions of refugees that was dispersed. 
And so my family became one of the lucky families, and we were told, hey, you're chosen, and you were selected to go to the United States. My family was conflicted, believe it or not. There's a difference between an immigrant and a refugee. A refugee, you're taken by surprise. You're taken by surprise. You didn't have a chance to plan, chance to plan for your journey. Where an immigrant may have a little bit more lead time. The circumstances are still difficult, but they may mentally get themselves ready, prepared to leave. Where a refugee, you're taken by surprise, and you don't know where you're going. So you are still connected to your homeland. There's that mental connection of it. So my parents struggled, and they said, why would we go on this unknown world. Why would we go? Why would we take that journey? Uh, but the options were, you either go back to Kurdistan, you could stay, face death, or you could go to the United States of America, and we don't know what type of life you're going to have. And so because of us, the children, my parents said, you know what, let's go. And at that time, it was quite difficult because, again, the United States, um, under the Bush administration, um, had called upon the Kurdish people to uprise, and then we withdrew the weapons. So the Kurdish people felt betrayed. They felt betrayed by Americans at that time and weren't feeling as safe to come to the United States. But I will never forget the day I stepped on the airplane. And again, very young. I was going to start middle school, fifth grade. And I remember as I got off the airplane, and there was this elderly woman, beautiful, gorgeous elderly woman, and she walked up to me. I was so scared. I was terrified. The whole airport was cold. I was surrounded by curious eyes and reporters and people looking at me and probably saying all kind of names to me. I, the good thing is I didn't understand what they were saying, but I could definitely feel that I wasn't wanted until this lady came up to me. Her name was Eileen. She came up to me and she gave me a stuffed animal. And then she had the world's biggest smile on her. And as soon as I saw her smile, I felt connected. My humanity was connected to hers. Her smile warmed the airport for me. I'm so glad that she was my first experience, my first American that I actually met. Her interactions with me set the stage of how I'm going to build a relationship with my adopted nation. Unfortunately, refugees today are not greeted the way I was greeted. Some of them don't even see or hear or feel connected to the true Americans here in the United States. Eileen is no longer with us today, though I miss her dearly, but I will never forget the impact that she had on me on that day. And so, of course, when he came to the United States, we were already given documents, right? We were given a permanent green card. And the permanent green card, though, it is a temporary solution. You're allowed to live in the United States, and you're given a Social Security. You're allowed to work so you can contribute back to the community. You're also allowed, permitted to go to school. And so I started school. I began to really carry on adult responsibilities, become the main point person for my parents to translate and interpret. I wrote my first bill when I was 10 years old. I didn't know anything about monthly bills and electric bills, but I was beginning to write them. And with that, within 90 days, the substance or the support that we were given through the Refugee Resettlement Agency ended. So within 90 days, my two former illiterate parents had to find a job. My father began to become a janitor for the church that actually sponsored us. My mother went to go clean hotels and then work in the hospitality industry to raise us. Within those 90 days, you're expected to learn the language, contribute, get a job. Now, how many of you would be able, within 90 days, to even get a job after your college degree? 
if you haven't already made the connections that you need and put a very valuable, worthwhile resume. So it's difficult, but again, we, we didn't let it stop us. The only thing that made it difficult for us to integrate in Fargo, North Dakota was really the weather. <laughs> The night, you know, below zero of temperatures were really difficult. We could not handle it. So in July of 1996, we fled the snow and we landed in the heat of Nashville, Tennessee. No one told us don't check out Nashville in July. <laughs> that was the worst month to come here. We, it was just so humid and sticky. We felt like we can't breathe and we started getting allergies and we just couldn't understand like this new place. <laughs> Um, though, this is the true classical uh, refugee experience. Once they really settle, many of them end up moving to other states. Um, so I'm considered a second migrant in Tennessee because I was settled in Fargo, North Dakota, but we chose to come to Tennessee. And this, going back to this, I give you one way of how I came. It's quite small. There's less than 3% of people who come through the refugee resettlement program. It's not massive. Um, many of others, so when I, here in the United States, um, you know, fell in love with a Dutch boy, a uh, Dutch young man, and I was a US citizen, I was bragging about how United States is the best and there's no way United States could come close to Netherlands and I would never go live in Netherlands. And so my husband was over there telling me, my future husband, that Netherlands is better than United States. Um, they're much more tolerant and much more inclusive, and there's much more equity than you find in the United States. It was a battle, I am very proud to say, I won. Um, and so he came here, but as a Dutch citizen, and I was a U.S. citizen, according to the law, I had every right to petition for him to come to the United States. And when I petitioned for him, it was extremely costly. I spent $9,000 in immigration fees alone. I told him that was my diamond ring for him. Um, and then, aside from that, when he came to the United States, he was given a temporary visa to visit here. But because he was a young Muslim man, he got caught up in the uh, backlogs um, and security clearance, uh, was not made in time. He actually became undocumented for the first two years of our marriage. At that time, I was terrified. I had graduated from college, started my first career, and I became pregnant unexpectedly. The fears I had in my mind of being a single mother were too much for me to handle. I was like, I did not work this hard for me to become a single mom. And at that time, uh, we had a policy where our local police officers signed a deal with immigration um, and custom enforcement to raid undocumented population. He couldn't drive. He could not finish school. He stayed in the house. And it had a major impact on our family. Again, through lots of loops in and out, um, he was able to finally gain U.S. citizenship. The reason why I shared these two stories with you is that it is not easy to navigate the immigration system that we have. It is not easy, and it also that it's filled with racism. It is filled with racism. We still put a higher value on certain type of immigrants over others. And so if you are white, you are more valued than a Nigerian who's black. Um, if you are a Christian Russian um, versus a Muslim who is from Syria. Um, so these exist, these loops exist. It has also became a business. Um, immigrants and refugees tend to pay a lot of fees, financial fees, just to get their family together. Now, immigration, we talked about immigration then and then now. Some of the, one of the key thing I'm hoping that you're gonna get out of this is that immigration is one of the core values of what makes America so wonderful. And within that, it is our diversity and inclusion that makes us beautiful, just like Emma articulated that through her poem. That once we actually recognize what diversity is, and then we include that diversity, we do become stronger and we do become better. If it wasn't for the immigrants, whether you were, you know, came here for economic opportunities or religious freedom or because 
people like me who ran away from ethnic cleansing, or you were dragged here by force, you know, to work in the slave industry, you actually built America. You have made America. And so I want you to think about right now, when I, th when I say who is an American, what comes to your mind? Is it someone like me? What does it really take to be an American? What defines us to be an American? Again, I want to link it back to one of the values I value Dr. Evans for. She really pushed me. She pushed me beyond my comfort, and she gave me the value of valuing my own mind, taking charge of my own learning. And so I want to pass that on to you. Don't be a sheep. Do not fall into ignorance. Because once the human mind falls into ignorance, that is when we are filled with fear. And then whenever there's fear, there's hate. Just like when we saw here in Murfreesboro with the mosque. And at first I thought it was just the mosque facing this. Then I found out it was the Catholics and then the Buddhists behind, before that. And so we have in America, though, immigration and diversity is one of our core values and strength. We constantly struggle with being inclusive. And we are constantly struggling with having equitable laws that really define us and strengthen us. So I want you to look into some of these resources and read more about it. Don't think that immigration is not impacting, impacting you. It is impacting every single one of us. Again, like whether you're a fourth, fifth, 20th generation in the United States or a first generation in the United States, it is having an impact on us. And once we actually take control of this core value, that is when our lives are going to feel much more connected. I want to lead you with a very famous quote by Desmond Tutu. He always said that my humanity is bound up in yours. So if we destroy each other's humanity, our humanity is destroyed. Thank you for having me. Certainly, Kassar is welcome, I'm sure, to take questions, but you know, Kassar, these students um, may not even know, unless they are Murfreesboro residents, about the mosque controversy that we had here just a few years ago. Do you want to kind of just tell them about that? They don't know this recent history? Those folks who are from Rutherford County will, but those of you who are not may not have heard of it. So recently, there have been many struggles that um, American Muslim population faces. The American Muslim population is very diverse. <laughs> Actually, the largest percentage is African American, uh, African Americans who were brought through the slave industry. Uh, so even here in Tennessee, um, in if you look at just the demographics of Middle Tennessee and then in particularly Murfreesboro, we also had uh, recent arrivals. Um, that came here. So some of them came here. Actually, they teach here at the university. The university brought a lot of professors, you know, brought doctors, brought, brought different type of professionals here. And so when the Muslim population grew here, they began to establish a mosque. Um, and when they bought the land to build the mosque, uh, there was an opposition that raised up and basically redefined freedom of religion to say freedom of religion is actually not for you. Um, it's for different denominations of Christian sect. And so they rose up against it um, and basically had a lot of misconceptions and myth about what goes on inside a mosque. Uh, some said it's a terrorist compound. And the imam was like, please come to one of the sermons. <laughs> um, you know, just a lot of, um, so there, there is this business, fear-mongering business that is deeply rooted in the state of Tennessee. And unfortunately, many other people are impacted by it. Um, however, the case went up to the court um, and we were able to defeat it and now there is a mosque that is built and it, its doors are open. It's called Islamic Center of uh, Murfreesboro. You're welcome to go visit and check it out. And recently, um, they've also had a couple of vandalisms uh, that took place. Um, two of the young men who actually vandalized the mosque by putting bacon all over it and um, you know, writing a lot of vulgar language, um, you know, with paint all over the building, even in the children's basketball court and the playground were extremely awful. I remember I took my daughter there to actually help with a cleanup. 
um, and she was on her feet and she was scrubbing really hard with a bunch of other uh, Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts um, in her group. And they were all trying so hard and she got so exhausted and tired and she looked at me and she said, mommy hate won't come off. <laughs> um, you know, because it literally said hate Muslims uh, on it and she was trying so hard and I said, nope, you gotta put your muscles into it, more into it. love overcomes hate, you're gonna do it. Um, and so that is what's going on in Murfreesboro right now. Questions for Kassar? Uh, first of all, thank you for sharing your story. I'm, I'm from a family of immigrants too. So um, the, the question that I had is you mentioned you paid $9,000 to get an immigration fees. I know at every, at every point in the process of, uh, you know, whether it's getting a green card or becoming a citizen, everybody has to pay yeah. a lot of money. Yeah. Do you happen to know what happens to that money? So um, some of that goes to UCIS, United States um, Immigration Office, and they actually use it for processing. So some of that goes directly. So for example, if you uh, fill out the citizenship paper, the N-400, I believe it's about $800 just for the form. So some of that money goes to the form. Then if you have a case where it's like my husband, then you also have to pay the attorney to represent you to build a case. Um, and then there's so many other things. Then you also pay for biometrics. It is really costly. Um, so my parents had uh, nine children. So all of us together had to go through the paperwork and you have to pay for the green card, you have to pay for the citizenship paper. And then even that it's intensive, they test you, it's different from 1800 immigration. You have to pass the English test, the civic test, and if you don't pass it, you can't become a citizen. You also have to be on best moral character. Like you're, even you're driving, if you drive and get speed limit, I mean speed tickets, uh, that could get in your way of naturalization process. Um, it is very intensive. Um, the cost is there. It's real. <laughs> the, the reason why I ask is for a system that's so broken that's generating potentially thousands or millions of dollars. I mean, there's a disconnect there. Where's all this money? How can it be used to help fix the system in a better way? But I don't know. That's why I was saying immigration has become a business, um, really. And if you look at it, that those are the questions that we need to pose our elected officials of, wait a second, because if you look at the narrative that's out there, they say that immigrants or refugees are actually coming and they're a burden on the economy. And when you look at facts and data, as I presented here, just of what they're contributing, even aside what they contribute to get their paperwork, um, is also real. Like they, they are actually putting more money into the system. Um, and so the question is like, what are you doing with it? The same way with our taxes, like, hey, taxes are really great, but let's look at the budget and how are we um, dividing up all of this is not going to happen if we don't uh, live and breathe democracy by contacting our ele uh, elected officials and having a really established relationship with them to say, hey, I'm growing my knowledge in that particular area. I've got my eyes on you and I'm voting. Um, this is the only way you'll make change happen. And if you look at it in the United States, so everything, all the struggles that we face, nothing is really new. Nothing is new. Like, for example, the Chinese Exclusion Act is quite related to the Muslim ban today and the refugee ban today. It is very, very compatible. Um, you know, you can tell, you know, I hate to say this, it may be very uncomfortable, but it is one of our biggest issues or diseases in the United States is racism. Uh, we have not cured racism. We actually, what I'm appreciative of the recent elections is um, that uh, Trump administration really made the invisible visible. I really thank him for that. He made it visible. No one can deny that we have illnesses in this country, that there are some deeply rooted racist things that need to be dealt with. Um, what I'm optimistic about is that we are going to make it through. We are going to rise above our struggles, just like we've done in the past. We've had some ugly, ugly histories, but we've gained the strength and the grit to raise above those uh, broken and shattered struggles. Other questions? <laughs> On any subject related to um, immigration or values or religion for that matter, because ours open for being forthright about whatever questions you might have. Sir? What was your first real activist experience in this country? Because you really get into activism. So there were two. My first real activism experience was actually in the refugee camp. Um, and so within the refugee camp, my mother in particular, she didn't want a lost generation. She connected with a bunch of other mothers and 
uh, you know, there were civic leaders who started underground schools. These were secret schools within the refugee camp, and they began to teach the Kurdish language, uh, and that was forbidden. And so I remember my pen was actually a stick, and my notebook was the sand, and we used to practice striking the Kurdish alphabets. My mother would take the nutrition label off of the cans, and I used to use it to write. I used to go on science experiments with my teachers um, and create chalks out of earth. And my teacher used to say, if you dig enough in the earth, you're going to find all shades and colors in the earth the way you find on people's faces. And so we used to go and create them. And so what happened, I began to recognize that even though my body was physically caged by barbed wires and armed soldiers around me, that the only way my soul could be liberated was through knowledge and through education. And I remember I became very close to my teachers, and my parents knew that they were risking my life by sending me to these secret schools under camps. Um, they knew that, but they you know, risked it. I knew that, and I felt that, because they used to hide what I was doing from the soldiers. Um, they used, you know, would come around, and I would act like I'm actually playing and drawing and doing things on the floor. And then within the refugee camp, um, especially when the Gulf War happened, what happened, I and a bunch of other friends, uh, we decided to mobilize within the refugee camp because the Turkish, there, there, there's two theories. One is that the Turkish government tried to poison us. The other one was the Ba'ath Party that was trying to poison us. Um, and so the bread that we were receiving was poisoned. Uh, many people died, children. I mean, I still have vivid memories of kids being dragged out of the uh, camps and elderly. Um, and so we mobilized um, and did a nonviolent demonstration and said, we will not tolerate this until we are given every human right um, that we need. Um, and so we really did that. But when I came to the United States, that was my sort of struggle. I was fighting in the refugee com uh, camp just to be me and to be Kurdish. When I came to the United States, I had the classical immigrant and refugee dream that America is utopia. Um, and so when I came to the United States and I learned that in particularly 1996 when Oklahoma City bombing took place, so the media initially said that it was some Muslims who did it. They were like pictures and videos and whatever. And so I remember coming home from school and I saw eggs being thrown at our door. Um, you know, they were just racist messages, um, you know, inappropriate or unpolite uh, comments. And I remember saying, what is these neighbors? These people know us. What just happened? Uh, until we turned on the news and we figured that out. And that was when I began to recognize that even here in the United States that I have to fight for my freedom now to practice my religion. So in the camp, it was me just to be able to be a Kurd and say that I am a Kurd. And then when I came to the United States, I had to fight and say that it's, I am a Muslim and I'm proud to be a Muslim and it's okay for me to be a Muslim. Uh, and I, you know, my Muslim faith moves me to contribute to my, faith, my community. And so that was when I began to do it. And then when, um, of course, 9-11 happened, I was at Tennessee State University. Um, I decided to take a challenge of being the first female president of Muslim Student Association. And I began to recognize that you cannot fight hate with hate. Um, so I began to facilitate and bring diff uh, people together to have courageous conversation. Uh, I really do believe that people, humanity, we, people, have the ability, the skills, the knowledge, and the wisdom to have courageous conversation about the differences of opinions that we have, the different perspectives that we carry. I do really believe it. Maybe I'm a little naive, but I believe it, that we can humanely have courageous conversations. And so ever since that day, I've been walking and advocating for more civil dialogue among each other. You mentioned that we can talk to politicians to try to solve these problems. What do you think we can do as students on a college campus to help um, solve these immigration issues? One, I would say recognize the privileges that you do have. Every single one of us have privileges, and there are those who don't have a privilege. Once I actually learned about the American history and the struggle of women to vote <laughs> through Dr. Evans, I began to vote, and I haven't stopped voting. Because that's a privilege that I have, and me not using that privilege is not right. And so if you have the privileges of voting, vote. If you have the privileges to give back, give back. 
if you have been granted with a special talent, then use that talent to perfect your community. And in college campus, I gotta say, this is the life. Life has different phases that you go through. And college life is one of those best lives. I know it doesn't seem that way. But when you get older and you become my age, you're gonna go back and wish you were in college. This is where you have the opportunity to connect. Connect to other people on campus. All of you and your professors are source of knowledge for you. Utilize it. Don't always talk to the same people. Be informed. Also, be informed about your life, your community. Don't let someone else make the decisions for you. And also, don't let people tell you that you're the future leader. You are the leaders now. You are the leaders. Take charge of it. Be informed. Be civically engaged. Have dialogues and conversations like these. Because the more dialogue and conversations we have, the stronger we become. And you're not always going to agree, and that is OK. Because it's been through the diversity of perspectives in the United States that also have strengthened us. Anyone else? Thank you. Oh, good. Excellent. Go right ahead. How is your family now? Are they doing well? My family is doing good. Um, I have two sisters who went into the education and they teach. I have one sister who is about to finish nursing. Um, two of my brothers went into uh, auto mechanics and they opened up their business. Um, unfortunately, one of my brother uh, fell in the traps of this opiate crisis affecting the state of Tennessee, uh, and he's dealing with substance abuse and the struggles of that. And if you notice, actually, the, um, the Pew Research Center put this together and found out that um, almost 42% of Muslim children are being bullied and harassed by in the school system. Um, and it's really huge. And oftentimes, it's not just by their peers. It's actually by professors and teachers as well. Um, and so their mental state, they're struggling with it. And so my brother struggled with that. Um, and then he fell into the substance abuse. Um, my parents are doing good. They're here. Uh, my mother, it took her forever to go through the naturalization process because she longed for home. She kept wanting to go back home, but they're both here. My grandmother said the same thing, but she's been buried in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, it's just, you know, they're making it. They're all working class um, right now, so they had a big jump, especially if you look at the Kurdish community, which we have the largest Kurdish community outside of Kurdistan in Nashville, Tennessee. So we have more than Germany. We have more than Dallas and um, California, they're actually in the heart of Nashville, Tennessee. And they chose, many of them chose Nashville, um, like my family. Others migrate or were brought here as refugees. Most of them are business owners, entrepreneurs, and then they're into the healthcare industry. Um, even my class, the, my parents, um, their classical sort of dream, immigrant dream for me was, I remember when I was finishing up high school and I was getting ready to go to college, he said, you have two options, my daughter. I was like, yes, Baba, what's your options? He was like, you either become a doctor or a lawyer, and that's it. I'm like, Dad, where are the options? He said, I did give you options. You had two, two options. Be graceful. You either become a doctor or a lawyer. And I was like, Dad, I can't be a lawyer because I cannot lie. If my client, I know he's guilty, I'm going to be like, he's guilty, you know, telling everybody he's guilty. I was like, I can't. And maybe doctor, I'll go be a doctor beyond borders because they really impacted me in the refugee camp. Um, however, I just uh, grew so much at Tennessee State University and I changed my major from biology to sociology. Didn't quite share with my father the difference between the two ologies <laughs> when I was about to graduate. Um, and once I was going to graduate literally a week before I was going to walk on stage and I was like, Dad, they're going to say biology. I mean, they're going to say sociology, not biology. I was like, yeah, that's great. So which medical school did you get accepted into? I was like, none of them. <laughs> um, you know, I broke his heart. He started crying. He said, you ruined your whole life. Um, he did not become proud of me or the work that I did until um, there were quite several of like refugee bans uh, that took place. And then when the president recognized me for champion of change, some of the welcoming work I was doing, and he was like, well, if the president think you're doing important work, then I guess it's important. <laughs> so now all he does is brag about the work that I do. But yeah. Thank you, Mr.